I am Daniel Lukies, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years. And today, I have my special guest. He's a award winning author award, no other than Mr. Stephen A. Wado. Hey, Daniel, how are you? I'm fabulous like you, Mr. Steven. And can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, as you said, my name is Steven Iwano, and I am a short story and novelist uh, based in Buffalo, New York. Um, it took me 30 years to get my first book published, which was uh, a short story collection called Muscle Cars. My first novel came out last year called Rook. And I'm excited tonight to talk to you about yesteryear. My novel is coming out this October. Wow. Congratulations. And more <laughs> books to come, Mr. Steven. Yes, I hope so. Uh, yes. So, yes, there is. How did you craft it? How did I craft it? Well, it's based on the true story of a man named Franz Stryker. And many people don't know um, Stryker's work or his name, but you know his work. He's the man who wrote and created The Lone Ranger and The Green Hornet and Sergeant Preston the Yukon and the um, Tom Quest Young Adult book series. And Yesteryear is about how he came up with the idea of The Lone Ranger. So it takes place in the 1930s um, and Stryker has to come up with this new character um, and the book revolves around how he comes up with the Lone Ranger. And there's a lot of other subplots involved as well. And the way I crafted the book, I really wanted to make it fun. So there's a, some magical realism in the book. Um, I was thinking about um, W.P. Kinsella's Shoeless Joe, which the movie Field of Dreams was based on, and um, Malamud's The Natural. So there's, there's a magical element in, in the novel of... Uh, all about the creation and the creative process uh, because writing is kind of magical and, and spooky as Norman Mailer said. Sounds interesting, Mr. Steven. So you, yesteryear, what behind the title of your third novel? Uh, well, the, the title, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I don't have many writing quirks. Like I don't burn candles or incense or have, a special tea I need to drink. But the one quirky thing I have is that I always have to have a title for whatever I'm working on. If it's a short story or a novel <clears throat> or a screenplay, it always has to have a, 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 a title on page one. And with Yesteryear, it was, Yesteryear was always the title. Um, and of course, it comes from the, the introduction of the Lone Ranger on the, the radio and, and, and TV show uh, when the announcer would said would say, you know, let us return now uh, to those thrilling days of yesteryear, and in a way, this novel, since it's set in the 1930s, I'm asking the readers to to return with me uh, back to that period in this kind of mythical setting of Buffalo, New York, uh, where magic takes place and and heroes are made. Um, so it's it's a it's asking you to to take a little journey back in time and maybe to a simpler time as well. Yes, indeed. Very well said, mister. So yesteryear, what do you think the best highlight? Well, you know, it's tough to say. I think the, the biggest highlight would be that, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of balls in the air with this novel. Um, like I said, Stryker's got to come up with the, the script for the, the Lone Ranger. Um, but he's got writer's block, um, a, a magical curse is put on him. There's a, a plot to assassinate Franklin Roosevelt. You know, some diamond rings have been stolen that, that he's responsible for. So I think the highlight of the book is that it, by the time we get to the end, all those sud plots, all those threads, um, they come together. And, and hopefully it's a, a satisfying read for, for the readers. Yes, indeed. 
But if you want to go back and if you want to revise the book itself, which part of the book you want to revise? Uh, I'm not ready to go back and revise it. <laughs> I've worked on it too long. <laughs> There's been too many drafts. <laughs> um, I think that'd be a slippery slope. I think that would cross into it's a dangerous territory because once you start, you know, once you open up that that revision box, then you want to start tinkering with everything. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stay away from revising this one and and concentrate on on writing something uh, uh, new. I think. Oh, uh, yes. So yes, the year. What are your struggles in writing with? Well, I think the first struggle I had is, um, you know, what the timeline of the novel was going to be. I mean, I knew, you know, since it was based on a true story, I, I knew the basic time elements of, of when Stryker was asked to come up with a new character um, for WXYZ, a radio station in Detroit owned by a man named George W. Trendle. I knew when the, the Lone Ranger premiered in Buffalo. Um, and, but Stryker is an interesting relationship with Trendle because before the Lone Ranger became as popular as it was to become, uh, Stryker sold the rights for $10 to George W. Trendle. And he did it because he was supporting um, about a dozen members of his extended family during the Great Depression. And Trendle, like they said in The Godfather, made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Trendle offered him job security through the Depression. He offered him more money, yeah, a salary position. And the caveat was he had to sell the rights to the Lone Ranger for 10 bucks. What was interesting, and this, this is, you know, again, based on facts, true story, that deal was made in 1934 and Stryker continued to work for Trendle for another 20 years until Trendle sold the rights to the Ranger for $3 million, which was a record sale at the time. So my first challenge was what's the timeline going to be? Am I going to cover the whole 20 years, the whole relationship that Stryker had with this man? Um, and I struggled with that. And then I finally decided that I wanted to focus in on the Buffalo years. I wanted to focus in on the weeks uh, where Stryker was first contacted to come up with a, a new, a new hero, a new radio show uh, until the time it premiered in Buffalo. Um, and so that once I had the timeline done, or at least fixed in my mind, um, that's when I, I, I really started writing and started working on it. Um, but a lot of research went into it up to that point. Um, a lot of research, obviously there's been so much written about the Lone Ranger, but when Fran Stryker passed away in the early 1960s in an automobile accident, his estate donated all his papers to the University of Buffalo. And so I had access, there's like 30 cartons of them. Uh, I had access to his notes, uh, his radio scripts, memorabilia, um, telegrams. There was a lot of um, primary source information that I, I, sh I shifted, sifted through um, before I came up with my imagined story of how the Lone Ranger came to be. Amazing and really interesting. So yesteryear, what do you think, what is missing in the novel? What is missing? That's a tough one because I threw a lot into this novel. It's part <laughs> noir. <laughs> it's part comic novel. It's part historical fiction. Uh, it's part, um, you know, biographical fiction. It has magical realism. I didn't. I didn't leave much out. I think if I threw anything else out, uh, my my publisher and editor would have a heart attack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, you know, with all those different elements, all those blending of genres. Um, it was really fun to write. I felt very uh, liberated and free while I was writing it. And, you know, I, I'm hoping that gets that comes across uh, to the readers. Oh, yes. So before we go on, Mr. Steven, I want to shout out to the people listening in the United States, especially in the state of New York. In New York, I got 24 percent. The Bronx at 80 percent. Uh, Brooklyn at 7%, uh, 
Coram at 7%, Seville at 4%, Deer Park at 3%, Buffalo at 2%, Yonkers at 2%, Liverpool at 2%, uh, Queens at 2%, New Rochelle, if I'm not mistaken, 2%, mm -hmm. uh, Westbury at 2%, Levy Town at 1%, Long Beach, Far Rockaway, Forest Hills, Larchmont, Estate and Island, Rome. Oh, you have Rome in New York. Oh, my yeah, goodness. Rome, New York. Absolutely. You have also Jamaica. Ah, interesting place. Del Mar, uh, Rochester, uh, Deacon Dorge, Richwood, Woodside, Penyon, or Penyon, yes, Penyon, mm -hmm. Port Washington. Fixkill, St. Johnsville. I think I have a lot. So I I want to apologize if I cannot read them all, but New York, thank you so much for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world. Like Mr. Steven. Mr. Steven, what age did you realize that you are good in writing? Well, I was a, a writer, a, a reader from early on. Um, my dad was a big reader. My older sisters were, were big readers. So I, I grew up in a reading family surrounded by books. And uh, my first memory of writing was in elementary school, um, writing papers, uh, writing short stories, um, you know, for extra credit or, or just for fun on my own. And I think I was a senior in high school when the hotel new hampshire by john irving was published and i remember finished reading that and thinking man i wish i could write a book like that you know where one minute you're laughing until you realize how sad it is um, i thought that was brilliant and i think from that point on i wanted to be a writer um and, and you know you know fast forward i'm in grad school it's the mid 80s and it's about the time when a lot of male American writers were having their, their first novels coming out and they were uh, all around 30 or just under 30 years old. Guys like Brett Easton Ellis, uh, Michael Chabon, uh, all, all those guys that were like four or five years older than, than I was. And I thought, well, here I am, I'm in grad school. I've always been a good writer. Um, I'm gonna be one of those guys. Uh, I'm going to have my first novel uh, come out before I am 30 years old. That was my goal. And, you know, 30 came <laughs> and 40 came. <laughs> and I, I think I was, I think I was 51 or 52 when, when muscle cars came out. Um, so it took a long time for me to get that first book published. Um, but I, I hung in there and, um, uh, you know, it, it, the, the last, you know, seven or eight years have just been a tremendous amount of fun now that the work is getting uh, recognized, you know, published and recognized. Yes, indeed. So who are your favorite authors that really influence you? Yeah, you, as I said, John Irving, he certainly did. Uh, William Kennedy um, with his Albany trilogy of uh, Legs and Billy Phelan's um, Greatest Game and the Pulitzer Prize winning Iron Reed. That was part of his Albany trilogy. And I love that because um, he really had such a strong sense of place. It was, you know, historic novels set in the 20s and 30s, which uh, obviously I love. Uh, and he was exploring a place like Albany, New York, you know, not like, um, you know, uh, San Francisco, um, with Hammett or um, L.A. with with Raymond Chandler, it was Albany, New York, and I just love that. Um, and so I, I really love Kennedy for his sense of place and trying to make Albany this fictional world that readers could enter. And so I'm trying to do that in Buffalo, in my part of the state, in my hometown. So William Kennedy is certainly up there. Richard Russo, another. New York writer, not a New York City writer, but a, a New York State writer. He also had that that strong um, sense of place in his you know work like Mohawk and um, you know Nobody's Fool. 
that small town New York world that he could explore. So I think those three guys, John Irving, uh, William Kennedy, and Richard Russo, really made a, a, a huge impact on me as a, a young writer and a kid coming up trying to, trying to write like them and break through. The writing style, you know, this book, Yesteryear, is a lot different than my first two books. Um, Muscle Cars is a short story collection. Uh, I call it it's 17 short, short stories about guys making bad decisions. Um, semi-autobiographical um, and my first novel Rook is about a, a, a bank robber based on a true life story of a man named Al Nussbaum who robbed about a half dozen banks before his wife or the FBI knew what he was doing and in those two books Muscle Cars and Rook the writing is is very uh, uh, spare it's very tight um, kind of hard-boiled um, and when I finished those two books, I was very proud of them, still am, uh, but I felt a little creatively restrained. Um, I felt like I wanted to write something bigger. Um, and so when I stumbled across Franz Stryker's story for yesteryear, I mentioned earlier that I was thinking of um, W.P. Kinsella's uh, Shoeless Joe and Malamud's The Natural. Uh, both of those are, are baseball novels. And so I was thinking of those two books. I wanted to write in that kind of spirit with magical realism and myth making. And, and because of those baseball novels, my mantra while I was writing yesteryear was swing for the fences. And that meant no joke was off limits. No sentence could be too long. Um, no subplot could be too far out or wacky. Just, just, Give yourself total creative freedom and write. So the writing style of those first two books, like I said, were, were tight and spare. And Yesteryear is, is much more um, kind of musical in the language. It's much more lyrical. Um, it's a book that, that um, I think if you read it aloud, it is you, your ear will really pick up on, on the rhythms of it. Um, so it was much different than anything I had done before. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I was just letting, my, letting myself go and having fun and, and hoping that other people would, would think it was worth publishing. Yes, definitely. Number one rule, people, if you love what you're doing, well, it will pay the price. So yesteryear, Mr. Steven do you think it will belong to the Pulitzer Award? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think this one will, uh, but, uh, but who knows? Uh, oh. I, I'm, I'm hoping that the book's well received. I'm hoping it kind of brings Franz Stryker's name back into the conversation because he really did have a, a huge impact on 20th century pop culture. And uh, I, I, I just hope people... Um, have as much fun with it as I did writing it. Yes, indeed. So before we go on, uh, I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast, Food 101, on our third season with Chef Alessandro, one of the best executive chef in one of the best restaurants in downtown Toronto. And our latest episode last week, we talked about... Well, Sammy Freddo, people, because it's hot, hot, hot. It's one of the best Italian desserts that you need to taste it because it's something else. It's one of a kind dessert, one of the supreme dessert in Italian cuisine. So please do listen, Food 101. And plus one more, of course, our book is out already, Food 101, Volume 1, Basics. is all about the basic things that you need to know to make your food delicious. So please do grab a copy, available on Amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide. So, Mr. Steven, are you in the or in the traditional publishing yeah all my books have been traditionally published they're all um distributed uh globally um through uh ipg um so yeah you can get my books um 
anywhere you, you shop online um, or in the retail stores, they can order them for you. And yesteryear, it's not out yet. That comes out October 3rd. But again, you can pick that up wherever, wherever books are sold and, and pre-orders are available now. Yes. So what are the pros and cons of traditional publishing? Well, I mean, the pros are that um, if you if you get your work published, um, it's it's been vetted. Um, somebody in the industry has said, hey, this book, this writer is worth investing in, in, in him or her. Um, so this book is going to be hopefully promoted. Um, you're going to get professional editing um, and you're going to get professional cover art. Uh, and this is no cost to you, right? This is the publisher making an investment in your book and in your career, really. Um, what that does, it allows you to uh, enter various con uh, contests and fellowships, uh, which a lot of that are not open in many cases to self-published authors. Um, the downside of it, it's really, really hard to break in. <laughs> just, the guy, just the guy who took yes. 30 years to get his book published. Um, so it's really hard. Um, and, and you have to work at it. And you, you have to have a thick skin to take all the rejections um, and disappointments. And you have to have enough self-confidence and belief in your work to, to keep getting up at five in the morning. And, and keep writing when no one in the world um, seems interested in what you have to say or, or, or any of your books. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. So that would be my, <laughs> the, the rewards are, are very satisfying, uh, maybe not monetarily, but, but certainly creatively. And, um, uh, but it's a hard road. Yes. So do you think rejection is the process to make you better and better? Yeah, that's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but it's true. I mean, the, the editors who do reject you or the agents who do reject you, and if they give you something concrete, um, if they say, hey, I lost interest at, after chapter eight, uh, at least they give you some direction to go back and say, all right, what happened there? Why did I lose their interest? Um, and you can start correcting it. Um, if they give you specific feedback, well, you know, I, I didn't, I thought this plot line was unrealistic or this character wasn't developed enough. If you read criticism like that and you agree with it because you don't have to, but if you agree with it, at least that gives you some direction to go back and, and make it better. And hopefully it falls across the desk of, of someone who, um, reads past chapter eight. <laughs> <laughs> Someone like your writing, right? <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. Oh yeah. What is your inspiring message for the aspiring writers out there? Don't quit. Don't quit. If you quit, you'll never be published. If you quit, you'll never be read. Um, if you give up, uh, it's going to nag at you um, that maybe you could have done more or done better. Uh, so you just have to just take the rejections, um, take the blows, um, work at your craft and, and hopefully, like I said, um, it comes across the desk of someone who b believes in the work. Uh, but if you quit, it's never going to happen. Yes, indeed. So do you think in the future you will be an indie author? Uh, you know, I, my, my goal is to keep writing and hopefully keep getting traditionally published. Um, that's my goal. It took me a long time to get here, so I'm going to continue with it as long as I can, as long as someone's still willing to, you know, invest in my, in, in my work. Uh, but that is, that's the goal. Knock on wood. Yes. <laughs> Knock on wood. Okay. So, yes, there you. What else you can say about it? Uh, what's really interesting about yesteryear is, it, you know, again, it's based on the true story of Franz Stryker, and he's the main character. So he he was a person, obviously, who's who was a real life uh, human being. Uh, John L. Barrett uh, was a radio actor, um, and he was the one who first performed the Lone Ranger on the air 
uh, on WEBR in, here in Buffalo, New York. And George W. Trendle, of course, who 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 ended up buying the Lone Ranger, he was a, a, a real person too. So my, my three main characters were real living people during the 1930s. Um, and again, remember my mantra for this book was swing for the fences. I said, well, why not have other characters who lived at that time? Um, so one of Slattery, uh, one of uh, Stryker's best friends is Jimmy Slattery, who is a former boxing champion um, from Buffalo, New York. Now, I, I don't know if Stryker and Slattery ever crossed paths. Um, Stryker certainly must have known of Slattery because he was a world champion. Um, but And they lived here during the same time. So, you know, Slattery's in the book. Um, you know, the mafia used to be pretty big here in, in Western New York. And the man that ran it for decades was a man named uh, Stefano Magadino. And uh, he was here in Buffalo in the 1930s. You know, again, no idea if he and Stryker ever crossed paths. Uh, I seriously doubt it. But why not put him in the book? You know, again, it's part noir. And, you know, introduce the gangsters into the story. Um, and you know what? Franklin Roosevelt was just elected president. Um, why not put him in the book, too? Have him come to Buffalo. Uh, so I took all these, you know, people who lived during that era um, and they became characters of yesteryear. And that was great fun. Uh, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, and, and like I like I've been saying, hopefully the the readers will will uh, uh, like those characters because they all are kind of lovable and likable. Um, even the even the mafia guys. Um, so that's why I like people to to think about if they're considering pre ordering the book. Yes. So yes, the year if you categorize it where it belongs. Well, that was tough, you know, because as I said, it's part noir, it's magical realism, historical fiction, biographical fiction. Uh, it's tough to characterize it. It really is. Um, <clears throat> I think they're marking it as historical fiction, which it certainly is. But there's all those other genres in there. Um, so I think, you know, people who really enjoy, enjoy noir are going to enjoy this. I think people who like a good comic novel will enjoy this. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot of different things, which made coming up with a cover art kind of a challenge, um, you know, cause what could represent all these different genres, um, and really be a, a, an effective marketing tool for the book as, as well. And what we came up is a very noirish cover with, you know, a typewriter and a glass of whiskey. Um, but we also, you know, pay homage to the, the comic aspect of the novel. And the fact that it's about the Lone Ranger, who is in comic books and comic strips in the newspaper. So the font on the cover is more geared to the comic books. Um, so it really is in the cover trying to show that it's, it's not one thing and it's not the other thing, but it's a couple different things going on. Very well said, Mr. Stephen. So what are the elements that you put in the story that make your readers glued to it? Well, there's a lot of interesting plots and subplots. There's a caper about stolen rings um, that Stryker has to get back. Um, there's a man with a very small chin who wants to assassinate FDR. Um, there's a, uh, a writer, Fran Stryker, who has writer's block. Uh, which Stryker never had writer's block a day in his life. Um, <laughs> but I put that in the novel because I'm trying to, one of the areas I try to explore was the idea of where do stories come from? Um, where did someone come up with the Lone Ranger? How did he get, you know, the white horse or the silver bullet or the mask? Um, so as Stryker's trying to fight through that writer's block, all those elements are all around him. He just hasn't realized it yet. But the readers know because it's 90 years later, right? And we know the Lone Ranger had silver bullets and a big white horse and we had a black mask. Um, so I think that's a fun element of the book that the, the Lone Ranger tropes are right in front of Stryker and he can't see him yet. And he can't grab him yet and put him down on paper um, until, until the very end of the novel. So I think, I think 
elements like that, the different plot lines. I, I'm hoping that keeps the, the people turning the pages. Yes, indeed. So let's talk about the main character of the novel. What, what so, can you say about it? So Fran, you know, again, Fran Strecker, um, I had a lot of primary information, you know, from his papers at UB. His son, Fran Stryker Jr., um, wrote a very good biography of his dad called his typewriter grew spurs. Um, so I, I knew what Stryker was kind, was like as much as I could glean. <clears throat> and then I just put my own kind of spin on him. Um, you know, I, I, I knew he was a good family man. I knew he was a good friend. I knew he was a compulsive writer. Um, he wrote, they estimated in the 1930s, uh, and he averaged 60,000 words per week. That's like a small novel every week because he wrote the scripts and the comic books and the comic strips and the novels of The Lone Ranger. So I knew all those elements of his personality. And then I just kind of molded him and gave him my own spin and my own imagining of how he came up with the Ranger. So is it easy for you to name your characters? Well, it was really easy with yesteryear because so many of the characters were real <laughs> life people. So I cheated on this one. Um, but um, in my other works, you know, I've never had difficulty um, coming up with names of characters. I try to look for characters that come up with names that are kind of unique uh, and memorable. So for instance, the novel that's going to come out in 2025 is called After Pearl. And my, my uh, main character is a detective named Nicholas Bishop. And everyone calls him by his last name. So he's Bishop. He's, it's it's an a interesting name. It's, not, it's an unusual name in some regards. Um, his, his partner, girlfriend, secretary, assistant, whatever we want to call her in that novel, um, she's an Italian woman. And her real name is, her full name is Giancarla, uh, but everyone calls her Gia for short. So kind of unique names, um, not difficult, short names that could be memorable for, for the readers. Um, those are what I try to shoot for. And, and, and so far, I haven't struggled with names too, too, too much. Yes, very well said, Mr. Steven. Are you a gardener or an architect in terms of writing? Am I a gardener or an architect when it comes to writing? Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I'm more of the guy driving down the road with the headlights off and the six pack on the front seat, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I don't have a plan uh, when I start. I don't have an outline. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did with yesteryear because I knew the basic timeline of, 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 of Stryker's story. Um, but I don't have anything, I don't have an outline that I work with. Uh, I don't have a wall full of sticky notes or a whiteboard. Uh, I'm really flying by the seat of my pants, to be honest with you. Um, and what, I, what I've learned as I've grown older and more confident in my writing is that it's all gonna work out. I'll figure it out. Um, and I just kind of trust, trust my own process that I go through. Um, so I, I, I'm neither a gardener <laughs> nor an architect. <laughs> man. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to put the fires out. In between. <laughs> <laughs> so, so are you the writer that uh, you balance your hero and your villain? Yeah, and what's really interesting um, <clears throat> that I'm finding with, with the, the book that's coming out in 2025 is when you have a character that has elements of each of them in them. I think that's really fascinating and really fun to explore. Um, but you have to have, you know, and it's basic. And it took me a long time to, to get the concept of story, right? And a story, and we've all heard this since, you know, seventh grade English class, that you have to have a main character that wants something and you have to have an uh, antagonist that is trying to prevent them from reaching that goal, whatever it is. And that clashing between the two is where the tension comes from. Um, so I'm a very traditional um, writer in terms of, of what story is. Um, and, and you have to have the two, you have to have the, the hero and the villain 
um, battling it out. And, and I think that's what makes people turn pages to see who's going to win. Yes. So, Mr. Steven, can you please invite our listeners to buy all your books? Oh, I, I would love to invite <laughs> all my all your listeners to buy all my books. Um, and, and you can find them, like I said, at uh, uh, online, all the usual places, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, you can go to your local indie bookshop. That's always the best. And if they don't carry it, they can order them for you. And um, yesteryear is available for pre-order as well. Or you can go to my website, which is www.sg, and then my last name, E-O-A-N-N-O-U. And you can order the books through there. And there's all sorts of information about um, my writing and interviews and, and, and my story um, on the website. So um, I'd love it if people stop by there. Yes, people, let's support Mr. Steven because if you support him, for sure, more and more books to come. Mr. Steven, what are your timeline for your books? Um, timeline um, in terms of, of when they come out or? Yes. So yesteryear comes out, yeah, Muscle Cars and Rook, uh, my short story collection and first novel, those are already out and available. Um, yesteryear comes out October 3rd of this year. Um, and you can pre-order that now. And um, my next book is called After Pearl. And that will be out sometime in 2025. So Stephen, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I had a lot of fun. Morikon people, see you soon.